John chapter 5, starting in verse 1, it says, Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one day of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city, near the Sheep Gate, was the pool of Bethesda, with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, Would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath, so the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. But he replied, the man who healed me told me, pick up your mat and walk. Who said such a thing as that, they demanded. The man didn't know, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, Now you are well, so stop sinning, or something even worse may happen to you. Then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. If you'll bow with me, let's pray together. Dear Lord, um, I just ask this morning that you would allow us to rest in your presence, that we would find joy in chaos, that we would find peace that makes no sense. As we sang earlier this morning, Lord, sometimes we sing words and we don't believe them and we don't, we don't think that they're true for us. So God, help us to believe and we can't believe. Help us to know that you are who you say you are, that you are good and kind and loving, and that you are calling us by name, calling us out of darkness and into the light so that we may dance and rejoice with you. I ask this morning that as we learn about you and your water and the water that you have for us, that we would enter into the peace of who you are. We would enter into the still waters that quiet our souls. It's in these things, in Jesus' name, that I ask these things. Amen. Amen. Um, The Lord is with us today. Um, He always is. Uh, but I was just reminded as we were singing, like he is, he is here. You know, we don't, we don't uh, get together just so you can hear me preach um, or hear whatever we're doing. We come together because of Jesus and he is uh, so worthy of all of our attention and our affection and love. He's worthy of um, all glory, and I was just, uh, as we were, uh, as I was praying before, I was just kind of led to uh, Luke 1, um, the story of uh, where the angel Gabriel comes and appears to uh, Mary before Jesus is born, and Mary asked the angel, after being told like she's going to, um, being told about Jesus, Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. Um, And he goes on and then says, for the word of God will never fail. Um, I don't know, I was just reminded this morning, like whatever it is that the Lord has uh, called you to, whatever he's put in your heart, um, he's not counting on you to use your own strength. He's not counting on you to be able to make it happen in your own power. In fact, the very fact that he called you to it is an indication that he's going to show up and do it. Um, and so if maybe that resonates uh, with, you, uh, with you this morning. Um, but the Lord is here, and he is with us. And so I just pray that as we um, talk about what this passage talks about, that you are just open. I'm open to what the Lord uh, might have to say to you, um, and I'm, I'm 
just in the season, I've been regularly reminded that, um, and reflecting on like preaching and talking in front of people about God, about Jesus, all this stuff, like um, there's what happens that comes out of my mouth, what I say, um, and then there's something like supernatural that happens where the Holy Spirit does something in between here and you and what the Holy Spirit puts from into your ears into your hearts. Um, and so I pray that the Holy Spirit uh, would speak to you in exactly the way that you need um, that anything not of him uh, would fade away and that the Lord would just do a work in you that, um, I don't know, it'd actually be really cool if you got something that was totally not even what I was talking about just because that's what the Lord does. So what we're going to do today is we're just, um, we're just going to walk through that passage, uh, kind of go, um, uh, not quite verse by verse, but section by section. So it begins with, uh, the question. here's the question I want us to ponder today. Uh, would you like to get well? Would you like to be healed? And then the follow-up question would be, do you think that Jesus can? Um, and we'll get to this, but notice I'm not asking, do you think he will? So, verse 1. Uh, afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. So what does this passage take place after? It takes place after a couple um, miraculous things that Jesus has done, uh, where he turned a bunch of water into, into wine. It takes place immediately following this story where this government official, his uh, son was sick and Jesus healed him from afar. And then it takes place shortly after a story of the Samaritan woman at the well. If you're familiar with that story, Jesus encounters her and tells her that um, he can give her living water. And she leaves the story, uh, or leaves that passage saying, this man told me everything I ever did. That Jesus had this insight, this knowledge, this sight into what she was going through that surpassed understanding uh, from a human f- form of perspective. And in John 4 as well, the, the official, it says that he and his entire house believed in Jesus. Um, and this woman went and told about what Jesus had done, and a bunch of Samaritans came to know uh, and believe in Jesus as well. So after this, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the holy days. So we've just seen these miraculous, powerful encounters uh, with Jesus. Uh, We're not told which holy day it is, it's just a holy day. Um, And then we get to verses two and three, which says this. Inside the city, near the sheep gate, was the pool of Bethesda. Your uh, Bible may say uh, Bethzatha, or others Bethsela. There's different uh, manuscripts that say different things. And there are five covered porches there. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. So we see this scene being set. Uh, Jesus, after healing this person who was sick, and after encountering this this Samaritan woman at the well, is going to a place where there are not just one or two, but crowds of sick people there, uh, present. Why here? Why are they all gathered here? Uh, We get a hint at it in verse uh, 7 where this man that Jesus uh, heals in this passage says, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Um, N.T. Wright, who's a New Testament theologian, argues that this place was well known for healing. Not only in uh, Jewish circles, but he argues that the evidence seems to indicate that not only Jewish people, but those who were pagan as well, considered this a sacred place. He argues that at one stage it was dedicated to the healing god, uh, Asclepius. And I think I pronounced that right. I Googled it last night to make sure that I was going to say that right. But does anybody know how to pronounce Asclepius to confirm? Huh? A-S-C-L-E-P-I-U-S, Asclepius. Anyways, just curious. Um, But the way that it seemed to work is that uh, every now and again, the water would bubble up and whoever was first in the water would be healed. Now, you and me are probably thinking, like, that's a very strange thing to sit around and wait for bubbles to come in water. That's not usually what I expect is going to happen when there's bubbles in water. I'm usually thinking there's a couple of other options that might be happening, but that's not one of them. Uh, Some apparently reckoned that it was an angel. An angel would come and descend upon it and, like, stir up the water, and then first person in would be healed. Have all sorts of questions. Why only the first person? How often does it happen? That's besides the point. The point is, regardless of how this thing worked, this was a place that was associated with like a healing, supernatural healing. So people would apparently wait here, crowds of sick people, hoping I could be the first person in the water. 
So this is the backdrop. Crowds of sick people gathered in this place known for healing. And verse 5 gives us a picture, kind of zooms in. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. Put that in context. This man had been sick longer than Jesus had been on earth. Waiting in a place, uh, he might get healing, but clearly had not yet. Uh, one commentary pointed out this time frame listed makes it clear that this was like had a permanence to his condition. In other words, this wasn't just uh, I had been sick for a minute or I had been sick for a year or two years even. 38 years longer than a number of people lived, this man had been sick. And verse 6 tells us something powerful. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? Uh, one of the interesting things to me about reading narratives is, in scripture is that we don't get all of the details as far as what happened. I don't know whether or not Jesus spoke with this man before to know that he had been sick for 38 years, um, but from the story of the, Samar the Samaritan woman at the well, Jesus had a way of knowing everything she ever did without actually having to hear it from her mouth because he sees and he knows. So I can't help but believe he also saw and knew, regardless of whether or not he had a conversation. Jesus sees this man in his pain, in his affliction, and asks him the question. And what the text does make clear is that it is Jesus who sees. Jesus first saw this man, or knew who he was. Um, in fact, the text indicates that the man didn't even know who Jesus was. Later, it actually kind of makes that really clear. But still, Jesus saw him in his affliction. Jesus saw him in his pain. So if you are a note-taking type, um, I don't always do this, but I'm gonna give you a couple points today. Here's the first one. Jesus sees you in your pain, and he knows the depths of it. Jesus sees you in your pain, and he knows the depths of it. Uh, you may, too, have been suffering for what feels like a lifetime. Maybe not 38 years, but it certainly feels like you have been suffering, walking through something difficult for as long as you can remember. Maybe you too have been sitting around at a place known for healing only to not experience yours. Jesus sees you and he knows. And you don't have to see him or know he knows for that to be true. Uh, you may feel unseen, you may feel unknown, you may feel like there is no hope. That doesn't change that Jesus is our living hope. Both things can coexist. The most painful parts of your story, he sees you, where you feel forgotten, left out, excluded. He hasn't forgotten you. And Jesus asked this man this profound question after seeing him and knowing this about him. Would you like to get well? Or as other translations would say, something to the extent of, would you like to be healed? You'd think the answer would be obvious, right? This guy's out of place, known for healing. Why else would I be here? But that's not what he says, what the man responds with. The New Living Translation begins with, I can't, sir. Or as the New Revised Standard Version says, um, which is, I think, more literal, uh, the sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Uh, notice Jesus didn't ask him, do you want me to put you in the water? Uh, Jesus doesn't ask him a method of healing. He just says, do you want to be healed? We'll come back to that. But why does this man respond this way? As opposed to like, duh, yeah, I'd like to be healed. <laughs> like, why else would I be here? Or just, yes, please, that would be nice. What is he feeling? Uh, my first thought reading this, particularly with the New Living Translation with that phrase, I can't, sir, uh, made me think he lacked hope. It made me think perhaps he felt reading into it, maybe frustrated, uh, very desperate. It's been 38 years that I've been sick, but still nothing. But it is actually possible to interpret this differently than that. St. John Christosom, who is an early church father, funny enough, he was born in Antioch uh, in modern day Turkey, uh, around, I think in the year 347, he wrote concerning this passage, the patience of the paralytic is striking. He stayed there and did not give up for 38 years, each year thinking he would be rid of his affliction. To critique a saint, I guess I would say that um, 
We don't know whether or not he was there for 38 years, just that he was sick for 38 years, just to add a little caveat. Of course, that could be a translation thing, but anyways, for St. John Christosom, he saw the man's very presence at this place known for healing after 38 years of being sick, an indication that he was persistent. He had not yet given up. Now, maybe part of him was like, clearly here, I don't know how this could happen for me. But he still showed up. He was still present. He was still there. At least part of him was hoping that something would happen. But at this point in the story, at least from his response, it seems he only expects one avenue for healing. Do you want to be healed? He thinks of the water. He sees how that hasn't worked out for him so far, and it didn't look likely. But Jesus doesn't ask him, how do you want to be healed? Or would you like me to pick you up and carry you to the pool when the water bubbles up? Jesus just asked, would you like to be made well? Do you want to be healed? How would you answer that question? Do you want to be healed? Now, if you're like me, probably your first response is like, whatever you're thinking of, whether that's a sin issue in your life, a natural uh, dispensation you have, maybe a response that um, you would like to be more loving but tends more towards bitterness or anger, uh, maybe a physical condition, whatever. Maybe your first response is like, yes, please. But before we answer that, consider some of the ramifications for it. Uh, Let's say you have been operating in one way of existence your whole life or for as long as you can remember. If you are healed, there are a number of ramifications for what your life must look like now. So, for example, I shared this example a couple weeks ago, but recently the the Lord highlighted for me like an area of uh, both wounding, uh, which kind of comes in healing, and sin in my life, which was an avoidance of conflict, a fear of conflict. And when I felt the Lord highlight it for me um, to confess and bring it to him and ask for healing, I immediately thought, been walking with Jesus long enough to know that I think I have a good idea of what you're going to invite me to do in order to receive this healing, which is put me in places where I need to step into conflict. And I said, okay, but honestly, the first thought was, I don't know that I want that. Would you like to be healed? Well, part of me says, yeah, but the other part of me says, like, like, let's, let's just say hypothetically, you're afraid of public speaking. And the Lord says, I'm going to heal you. And you think, okay, if I'm healed, then that means the very thing that is, I use as an excuse, I can't actually go and do. I'm actually going to be called to go and do it now. How do I feel about that? Do you want to be healed? Am I open to learning to experience the world in a whole new way? Um, there is a sense in which our... Um, Uh, our woundedness, our sickness, our um, all these things can become a way or of of an excuse for not stepping into what God has for us. Um, One way that you might think of it, anybody here familiar with the Enneagram? Okay. Um, It's a personality test. Um, Each type, there's like nine different types. Each one has different uh, fears, longings, desires, and ways of operating into the world. Um, So, You might say, if you are one type, there might be a response that says, well, I can't do this because I'm a type, whatever. Are you open? Are you willing to step into a new way of life should the Lord choose to heal you? Do you want to be made well? What if you don't have that thing anymore? So let's say, hypothetically, you say, yes, I do, which I I actually don't know that this guy even really technically said yes, (laughs) as clear as that. Um, though it seems he wanted healing. Verse eight, Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Notice, at a place notorious for a particular way of healing, Jesus goes an unexpected route that clearly was of his power and not of the world. So he didn't say, I'm gonna make this bubble bigger than you've ever seen, and I'm going to lift you up somehow with telekinesis and put you in there. That would've been cool too. All he says, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Are you open enough to receive God's healing in a place you wouldn't expect? And here's the second point. Jesus can heal any way he chooses to do so. Is there anything impossible for God? If even the rocks can cry out in praises, he can do what he wants. 
in those that follow Jesus, we have the same spirit that rose Jesus from the grave alive in us today. That's what the scriptures teach. We see Jesus moving in power. We see the Holy Spirit using followers of Jesus to do things that are surpassing understanding. Jesus can heal any way he chooses to. And as far as I understand, there's a couple of ways that this can come. Uh, One is immediately, um, where the kingdom of heaven, like in this story, breaks into a present moment, and God supernaturally heals someone in a moment. Um, That can happen in a moment of prayer. Maybe that's even just like setting you free from a sin or addiction. You've probably heard it in regard to um, when someone gets saved. There's different stories uh, where some have a sin issue that's in their life that's an ongoing journey of healing. But other people say, I used to be like this, I came to encounter Jesus, and now that desire entirely is gone. So one way is Jesus can heal you immediately in a moment. I believe that. And sometimes he does. Another way he can heal you is over time, over the course of your life. Um, I can think of a number of examples in my life of things that people prayed over for me, or I prayed over myself to receive healing, or... um, not wanting those desires anymore, whatever the thing was. And in the moment, I don't know that I saw that much of a difference. But looking back 5, 10, 15 years, I can look back and say, wow, the Lord really, at least at this moment in my life, those things are not um, what holds me captive anymore. There's healing that comes. Um, The third way is he can heal you in the age to come. That you may not receive earthly healing this side of eternity or this side of the resurrection when Jesus comes and makes all things right, but there's a very real truth that all followers of Jesus one day will be healed. Another way Jesus can heal, just to add on to it, is that Jesus can also heal us through suffering. Um, And there's different routes of healing. There's physical healing, there's uh, more spiritual, emotional healing. I think of uh, James, count it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So let steadfastness have its full effect so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Jesus can heal us any way he chooses. Um, I was listening this past week to, um, there's a pastor's cohort that I've been a a part of, and um, they were They go to like local churches and talk to different churches that do particular things very well. And this church tends to be um, very open to like movements of the Holy Spirit. Um, Ironically, I think starting out the pastor, uh, probably similar to me, came from a background where that wasn't really possible. Like where we didn't really believe that the Spirit could move in power in that sort of way in the present moment. Um, But now 14 years in, they've seen some really wild crazy things of the way that the spirit shows up. And so they had two pastors up there kind of doing like a, they call it, I think, a and r question and response. Um, and the two pastors were saying these two things. All present healing is temporary. We see this man in this story get healed. It's not said in the story, but I'm pretty confident to say that he is dead now. Fair? All present healing is temporary. You may be healed in a moment, and praise God, we will celebrate it. You are still going to die unless Jesus returns. And at the same time, what the other pastor pointed out is all sickness is also temporary. For all who follow after Jesus, all sickness is temporary. Now, my guess is if you're like me, one of these seems to ring true more so to your story. I hear the first one of all present healing is temporary, everybody dies, and I'm like, amen, that's my experience. But all sickness is also temporary, as Revelation talks about. Um, There will be a day when he wipes away every tear from our eyes and death will be no more. Do you believe that? Like that your present affliction is not actually what is going to last, ultimately. John Thompson, who's a pastor in um, somewhere in Canada, uh, wrote a book called Convergence, and in there he was talking about this. He said, the Bible is clear that not everyone will be healed in this life, but all believers will be fully healed when Jesus returns. However, God sometimes chooses to miraculously heal some of us now according to his sovereign will and for his glory. So we want to be open to that, to follow the prompting of the Holy Spirit, and to ultimately seek God's sovereign will above anything else. When we align ourselves with God's will, that's when his power will come. And I'm not gonna dive into this, but he dives into something he refers to as like asking for permission. 
uh, with God because there are times when people pray over someone for healing and it can actually really inflict damage if it's not actually what God has called them to do. Um, to pray over someone for healing and not have permission from God and it leads to actually a faith crippling experience. Um, but there actually is another way that when we pray in faith and God has led us to do it, that it actually can be an avenue for God to demonstrate his power in the moment. Um, so all present healing is temporary, all sickness is temporary, Jesus is eternal. It's like it almost would be easier for me if every time I prayed with faith, Jesus did it. But I'm not left with that. I'm left with, does God heal in a moment? Yes, sometimes. And does God, for whatever reason, not heal in a moment? Sometimes, yeah. The truth is, we can ascribe, uh, I think for some of us, we can ascribe more power uh, to our sickness than we do to God. Uh, where our sickness, our sin, our whatever, uh, defines us in every aspect of life and we refuse to believe that God could possibly heal us, that God actually wants what is good for you. Jesus rose from the dead, of course he can do what he wants to. On the flip side, uh, others of us can make health our idol, uh, where we think if I'm physically good, then me and God are good. If I'm emotionally feeling happy, then me and God are good. But that's not Jesus' experience, that's not Paul's experience. Paul pleaded with the Lord three times about this thorn in his flesh, and he heard a message, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So Paul says, so I'll boast all the more gladly in my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest on me. And from my understanding, he's pulling on ancient, like, tabernacle language, pointing to the presence of God coming and residing in a particular place. We are to worship God, not healing. We are to worship him, not just what he can do for us. And the question, I think, for us is, do we trust God more than our level of sickness or, uh, and more than our level of health? Or to put it in kind of marriage vows, will you trust him in sickness and in health? I heard uh, Pastor John Ortberg said that a lot of us come to faith, like um, one of the ways that the scriptures uh, def uh, talk about the relationship between Christ and the church is like the bride and bridegroom. And he was saying that uh, at times uh, we approach our relationship with God with a marriage vow of what's the least I can do that you won't divorce me. But that's not, that's a terrible, terrible marriage vow. Will you trust him in good and bad, in sickness and in health? Because your sickness can be a primary avenue to see God's healing and transformative power in your life. My experience has also been that God takes what uh, was my sickness, takes what is my pain point, my woundedness, and actually turns it to be a beacon of healing for other people, even when I don't totally see it yet for me. At the same time, God's healing in a moment can be a demonstration of his power, as John Thompson wrote, for some of us, he will heal, and for others, our suffering will become the place where our joy grows the most. And my assumption is, once again, that some of us are more prone to say, like, all present healing is temporary than we are to say that all sickness is temporary. Once again, it's clear as mud, right? Really, to make it simple for me, God can heal. I don't know if he will right now. But he has power to, and I trust him to do what he wants to do. So the question is, why do many of us not believe he can do it? Uh, there's a number of different reasons. One would be more philosophical um, concerning the uh, Enlightenment, which was a philosophical movement that split like the spiritual and the physical. And so in church world, you, this is broad over, over generalization perhaps, but you had some that really leaned into the spiritual side and then pushed away things like modern medicine and science. So if you pray with enough faith, God's gonna heal. Um, then you have another side that moves more towards like rational thought. Okay, that stuff done, or maybe in theory, I believe that could happen, but really God heals us through medicine and God heals us through, now we're more comfortable with talking about therapy and other stuff. Um, but once again, we're whole beings. God can heal through a number of these different ways. So why do many of us not believe he can? For many of us, it's not theological. It's experiential. Uh, there are uh, theological camps that believe that um, those like gifts of the Holy Spirit stopped at a certain point. 
Um, but for a number of us, that's not necessarily what we totally believe. We just don't know really what to do with this, like, what if God can heal someone in a moment? Like, I believe he can, but, like, I don't know. Have, have, I, have I seen that? Have I experienced it? Do, we, do I pray for it? Um, so this can be, uh, this experiential thing can play out a number of ways. Uh, one, we've not seen it. Uh, we've not experienced it ourselves, and so it's really hard to believe because I've not seen it. I've not seen it modeled. I don't, I don't know. My journey into more being open to the Spirit started very theological. Um, I see this in Scripture. Um, and then a reframing of some experiences that I'd had, particularly regarding like dreams and other things. Um, and then stepping into spaces where people had. Um, another way is that you've seen it misused. You've seen people, or maybe even experienced it, where someone prayed over you for healing and it didn't work. Um, and so there's a pain point in there. For others of us, though, it's not even that. It's just that we've heard about it being misused. Uh, we've not actually even experienced it ourselves. We've just heard about it. Um, and maybe a really honest answer is that maybe we're afraid of what it means if he can and does sometimes. Because that's messy. That's complicated. Um, and I'm not here to dive into all the reasons why he can and does sometimes and why he doesn't. Um, but we live in a moment, and this might be, um, I'm trying to see if we have any, I don't think we have any Gen Z people in here today. Or definitely no, I guess maybe he's Gen Alpha. Um, so you guys have probably heard the phrase, I'm spiritual but not religious. Have you heard that? Um, how many of you, this is not, I'm not trying to make anyone feel upset or whatever. How many of you shop at Target ever? Great. Um, have you looked at the book section recently in the past like year or two? Okay, I remember when I, when I noticed this recently, um, they were selling uh, a variety of like uh, witchcraft books and other stuff like prominently displayed. And I'm not, I'm not here to make a case on whether Target should or not. They're a business and they're trying to make money, right? They're putting things in stock that they believe will sell. So what does that indicate? People believe in the power of something spiritual. Uh, Belmont, uh, right across the street, um, this has changed since I was, uh, I went to Belmont, I think there's a s store that sells like crystals and tarot cards and all this other stuff. Um, there's a whole movement on TikTok, like witch talk, um, and people who are like into witchcraft plus Christianity, once again, whole other sermon or message, but my point is people are looking to the supernatural, the spiritual for help. So why do we come into a church and not expect the one who Jesus, who rose from the dead to actually be more powerful than any of those other things. People are looking for it in other places, and I believe Jesus is bigger and better than all of that. Once again, that's a whole other sermon, or a bunch of sermons, or several books that will make you think for like two years before you feel comfortable saying anything about it. So, in this story, though, right, Jesus doesn't go about the conventional way of healing. He says, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And as N.T. Wright pointed out, when Jesus says, get up, that is a word regularly used in the New Testament to describe the resurrection. Get up. You've been made new. You were dead, and now you're alive. This is a new way of being. And to point out what is hopefully rather obvious in this story, one person here got healed. In a community of sick people, this one person got healed, and the others were just there. But Jesus still showcased his power. Not everyone was healed. He healed a sick person around a community of sick people. And perhaps the message for us is he has a bigger plan right now than our uh, immediate um, healing. Verses 9 through 10. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But the miracle happened on the Sabbath, so the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. Point three, we like to put Jesus in a box. The religious leaders are upset this happened on the Sabbath day. They got more caught up in what ought to have happened than the miracle that Jesus did. They care more about the box they made, which from my understanding, this regulation about not carrying a sleeping mat wasn't, Jesus wasn't violating Hebrew scriptures. This was a not biblical law regulation concerning the Sabbath. But do we not also put Jesus in a box? 
When you see or hear stories of God moving in someone else's life, uh, rather than asking God, is this you? We try to just quickly explain it away. We dismiss it. We argue it instead of celebrating it. I'm, I'm preaching to me. What if God moves outside the box of what you think he will? Are you open? Depending on your tradition, if you grew up in one uh, like me that more was like healing comes through medicine and God uh, gives people the gifts of like being doctors and study and education and God heals people through that. God can heal people through therapy. If you're like me, maybe you need a, a challenge. Can God not heal through prayer, prayer, through the power of the Holy Spirit? And maybe you grew up in a tradition where the only healing you ever heard about was when someone prayed with enough faith. Maybe you need to hear, God can heal somebody through medicine. And for whatever reason, someone also could not be totally healed, and it's not for a lack of faith. Once again, it's much messier. But God's not a genie. He's a person to be trusted. Verses 11 through 12. But he replied, the man who healed me told me, pick up your mat and walk. Who said such a thing as that, they demanded. So note there, he didn't, well, we'll see that in the next verse. He didn't know who this was, just the man who healed me. The man's response to healing is obedience. He didn't even know who did it. Like the Samaritan woman who said, this man told me everything I did, point four, the response to healing or grace is obedience. When we recognize our sickness, when we recognize our depravity, when we recognize our sin, when we recognize our woundedness, when we realize who God is and what he has done, the natural response is to listen and to do what he says. Like, I don't totally know who he is, but he healed me. He changed my life. I was blind. But now I see, I don't know about this, but I was blind and now I can see. I don't know all what it means, but he changed my life. He rescued me. He saved me. The response to healing is obedience, verses 13 through 15. The man didn't know, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, now you are well, so stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. Then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. Jesus calls us to respond to what he has done by following him with all that we are. Just because he says it. In this text, also, there seems to be a connection between wholeness and holiness or healing and holiness, that God doesn't give us grace so that we can keep on living the same way, but does it uh, for us to operate and live in grace? Uh, there's a word in the New Testament, uh, one of the words used to describe salvation also can mean healing. Um, and there's a correlation between those things, that God cares about our whole self. So how do we... How do we respond? Um, I'm gonna invite Carly to come, uh, come back up. And what we're gonna do is I'm gonna um, give us some, like, um, some prayer prompts. Uh, I'm increasingly just more convinced than ever, like we just need like, to encounter God. Um, you don't need to hear another clever word or anything like that, you just, we need Jesus. Um, and so I wanna invite you just to um, close your eyes, not that that's, magical formula, but just to be paying attention to what God might have for you. And imagine Jesus asks you, do you want to be healed? Um, ask the Holy Spirit to highlight to you the area of your deepest need. Uh, maybe it's a pain point for you. Maybe it's something from your upbringing. Um, maybe it's a pattern in your life that you can't seem to shake. Uh, maybe it's sin in your life. Maybe it is a physical condition. I don't know what it is, but just ask the Spirit to highlight to you the area of your deepest need. Come, Holy Spirit, search us and know us. And as the Spirit does that, uh, I invite you to um, bring that to God through imagining Jesus, as Carly said earlier, like Jesus is there looking at you.
and to ask Jesus to show you he sees you and he knows that he understands. I'm paraphrasing here, but this passage was just uh, highlighted to, to my mind um, that our great high priest is one who's able to empathize with our weakness. He was tempted in every way, yet did not sin. I was reading something uh, a little while ago that talked about this, uh, Jesus' response to our sin being one of empathy and our woundedness being empathy, compassion. So ask Jesus to show you he sees you. And so, God, I, um, I come to you and I just ask that um, you continue to reveal more of yourself to us as we sing and we respond to who you are, to encountering you. Um, and I know a lot of us, when we feel like we might even encounter you, we start to question it immediately, like the, the, the question that... The enemy asked uh, Adam and Eve in the garden or Eve in the garden, did God really say? Um, and if that's you, uh, I just encourage you to just like, rather than just internalizing that question, to um, externalize that question and just ask God. <laughs> like, God, did you really say? Ask him. He's not playing hard to get with you. He's not trying to hide his face from you. The Holy Spirit, come. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for watching the service. We pray that it blessed you and helped you grow closer to God. If you are in the Nashville area, we'd love for you to join us sometime. If you're not in the Nashville area, we'd love to help you get connected with the local church if you don't already have one. But we pray that God blesses you this week and that he grows you closer in your relationship with him and with your community, and that he uses you in a powerful way to be a vessel of his good news in everywhere that you go. May God bless you.